I thought that I would talk to you a little bit about Franck, about maybe something about the man, his life, uh, his style of writing, and take you through the sort of the form of this piece. Because I think that it's, um, some of Franck's music is sort of amorphous in its form. The piano quintet, for example, or I think this piece, because even though he marks out that it's a prelude, chorale, and fugue, the movements go without pause. And it can be a little bit confusing, especially since he uses this cyclical technique, which he utilized in many works of bringing themes back towards the end that he created in the beginning. So it seems, I don't know, I think it's a little complicated to grasp. So I thought maybe it would be interesting for you to hear a little bit about it. Um, I guess it would be good if um, you could call up the score on your phones or iPads or whatever you have. Um, so one thing is, you know, Franck, we always play Franck on these French programs. Um, and there's this big issue right off the bat as to whether Franck was French or not. Um, he was actually born in, born in Belgium, but he and his father were constantly applying for French citizenship getting it, then going back to Belgium and coming back and forth. So it's a little murky as to what his actual nationality was. But I think it's a fair thing to, to play his music on French programs, to consider him essentially a French composer, because he lived really the vast majority of his life in Paris and was sort of quintessentially French. And Belgium, as you may know, is a sort of a, a, sort of a created country, which is sort of half uh, Flemish and half French and Flanders. So anyway, um, so Franck um, was born in 1822 and died in 1890. So he was 68 when he died. Um, so Beethoven was, um, he was five years old when Beethoven died. Um, he was, he outlived Liszt by four years. So he, and he knew everybody in between. Debussy and all of these, all these French composers. Um, Franck was one of the um, French composers, one of the relatively few French composers who was um, more influenced by German music than by French music. And a lot of French composers, Debussy, Ravel, the more famous composers that you think of, they were actually trying to reject German music, the forms and the language, and they were trying to create. And there's historically a sort of a, um, not hostility, but the French and the Germans don't always get along, let's say. I mean, there have been many wars and many hostilities of various types between these two cultures, these two very proud and great cultures. Um, so, but, but, but Franck was, he loved Bach, he uh, loved Wagner, he loved French, just German music in general was a big influence on him. So, um, when he was a boy, he was extremely gifted, obviously, and his father, he had a very, very pushy father, a stage father, a tiger dad. And um, his father was determined that Franck should be a famous concert pianist. And he devoted, really, all of his efforts for many years, really until Franck finally got married when he was 25, just to get away from his father. Every waking hour, the father was towards trying to make Franck a famous concert pianist. But Franck had no interest in being a concert pianist. I mean, he, he was quiet, he, was, he played the organ, he wanted to compose. He wasn't, he didn't really we didn't want to be on stage. He was a very humble, religious, uh, quiet, person. Um, and I, I found, you know, doing a little bit of research for this, actually, I found things that were very interesting to me. Um, the father had him play for Franz Liszt when uh, Franck was 12. And Liszt, who was a genius in more things than we can say, wrote to the father and he said, young Cesar seemed deficient in the social qualities required by the career proposed for him. He lacked the proper personality to be a concert virtuoso and have a piano career. Um, that's very interesting, I think, that Frank 
that Liszt met Frank when he was 12 years old, and he saw right into his soul. And he said, this boy is not, doesn't want to be, he doesn't have a big ego. He doesn't want to be on stage. He doesn't want to travel. He's not him. Frank is not this. That's what he was saying. But he thought that Frank was extremely gifted. He predicted that his growth would be slow and great, which was true. And he wrote many letters to people urging them to support him in his efforts as a composer, particularly as a composer. So I thought that was sort of interesting. Um, so anyway, he eventually became basically two things. He became an organist and a composer, and, um, and a teacher. So he studied at the Paris Conservatory. He lived in Paris his, almost his whole life. He was an organist at the famous churches in Paris. For 32 years, he was the organist at Saint Clotilde, which is one of the big, big churches in Paris. And for almost 40 years, he was the composition professor at the Conservatoire in Paris. So he taught Chasson and Dandy and really all the French composers of the time and influenced them a lot. I mean, even Debussy, who didn't really want to admit that he was influenced by Franck, was extremely influenced by Franck. He became very, very famous for a few things during those years of being a great organist. He was famous for improvising. And I think that to understand his music, you have to approach it as though this is being written by a great improviser, because it's a super important element uh, of the music. Um, also, he modulated. He loved to modulate. His, you just tell the students, modulate, modulate, modulate. He always wanted them to be playing around in different keys and constantly moving around and this all kinds of bizarre chromatic uh, modulations, and I think that's also ex an extremely important aspect of his music. Um, he really, although he composed his whole life, really almost all of his major works were written in the last 12 years of his life. So, like maybe from the time he was early 50s to his death in, in, at 68. He died in an auto accident, an um, early auto accident. Um, he wrote, starting from age 46, he wrote 12 organ works that are largely considered to be the greatest organ pieces since Bach. So for organists, Franck is a god. I mean, he was not just a great historical figure as a player, but he gave them some of his great, great works. Um, but actually, in general, he really wrote only a few uh, relatively few pieces, and um, some of them are for the piano. But he, this is, oh, I should have said, this is his, we're celebrating his 200th birthday this year. This is his 200th birthday year, so um, that was one of the reasons I thought it might be nice to talk about him today. <coughs> he wrote a big symphony, the symphony in D minor. Um, this piece was once played as often as Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony, or I don't know, Mendelssohn Italian Symphony was a core part of the repertoire, and now sort of not played so much. Um, but that's one of his major, major pieces. So for the piano, or involving the piano, there are really three major pieces that involve the piano. One is the symphonic variations, Variations Symphonique, for piano and orchestra. Uh, which is quite short, it's maybe 13, 14 minutes, something like this. And this is a really great piece for those of you who don't know it. And a very practical piece, you know, it's good to have some short concertos. You know, sometimes con conductors ask you to play something short, or you're playing on a Pops concert, or they want to do two big pieces on the first and second half, so they want you to play two short. I've played the front, the symphonic variations with, um, I've played it by itself, I've played it with the Liszt flat I've played it with Totentanz, with Rhapsody in Blue, because these are all short pieces, like under 20 minute pieces. So it's actually valuable to play a place, because in the front, Symphonic Variations is a very audience friendly piece with um, well, some of the same qualities of, of all these pieces, but it's more, it's not so um, maybe religious or as devout as the Prelude Chorale and Fugue. Uh, although the middle section is incredibly like praying, I think. Um, 
There's the violin sonata, the violin piano sonata, which is one of the most equal of all the violin sonatas in terms of the piano's part. Um, there's the piano quintet, which is very dense and passionate and romantic and modulates like crazy, has the sequence after sequence, and there's another piece that I think it's hard to make sense of, the structure is hard to make sense of. Um, there's another work of piano orchestra, sort of the piano is sort of obligato légine, um, which is really not played very much except maybe in France. Um, there's another piano piece, the prelude aria and finale, which is a little shorter and maybe not as, not as great as the prelude chorale and fugue. The prelude chorale and fugue is this great solo piano uh, masterpiece. Um, so that's a sort of a, a general um, thing about, about his sort of background. Um, you know, when we think of ourselves as being, um, having a relationship with a composer, it's usually because we play many pieces by that composer. But um, Franck, he didn't write that many pieces. So, I mean, it's hard, one wouldn't say necessarily that they're like a Franck specialist or, you know, that that's um, an important part of their repertoire. But in some sort of weird way, for me personally, I feel like he's a very important composer to me. Um, the violin sonata I've played since I was, I don't know, 12, maybe. My brother was a violinist and growing up all my friends were violinists and it's still the instrument that I love so much and play. I've played that with so many violinists I can't tell you. And you know, even just last week, I was at another festival and there was a great French violinist there and um, we're talking. She said, oh, I'd love to play with you next year at this festival. I said, I'd love that too. And we we're talking about what do you want to play? You know, and we talk, went through all the this and the this and the that. And, the, and then, and by the way, they've done the Franck Sonata with cello at this festival. They play the Franck Violin Sonata with cello, with double bass, with flute. I mean, it doesn't sound really that great with any of these instruments. I mean, cello is the next best, but they have to go down instead of up. For, but, you know, it's just a great violin piece. And she said, but of course, why don't we first do the Franck Sonata? And I said, of course, I mean, of course. Because if you want to get to know a violinist, the first thing you should play with them is the Franck Sonata because everybody plays it so personally and it's so romantic and it's so, it's so uh, the opportunity for colors and imagination and things and you get to know that person, you know, their soul. And then you can play anything. If you play, if you work with the Franck Sonata, it's, um, and just on a practical note, if you're learning chamber music pieces for your life and your career, you should learn the Franck Sonata because, first of all, it's great fun, but you can make more money playing the Franck Sonata. You play with violinists and cellists and double bass players and flutists and everybody wants to play it. And really, I don't think there's a single piece that a, a violin, a chamber music piece I've ever made more money off than the Franck Sonata. So just you know, for what that's worth. Um, when I was in Juilliard pre-college, um, I guess it was my last year there, um, the, the, the concerto competition uh, that year was the symphonic variations. And um, so I entered that competition and, um, and I won that competition and played for the orchestra in Lincoln Center and it was a very exciting uh, thing for me. And um, you know, and it just, I just felt like, well, wow, I love the violin sonata and I love symphonic variations. Um, you know, um, the schools were different days then, and there was a teacher, you probably don't know this name, Anya Dorfman. Does anybody know Madame Dorfman? Um, Russian pianist, you know, um, on the Juilliard faculty. She used to smoke the cigarettes with this big ivory cigarette holder, so she'd be smoking like this. She always wore a silk turban on her head. And it was her student that came in alternate to me in that competition. And the next week I went to school, and. I got to the elevator and then Madame Dorfman comes in, you know, smoking. You could smoke in the elevators in those days. You know, oh, you. <laughs> you boy who won your competition. I said, yes, Madame Dorfman. She goes, my student, much better than you. <laughs> yes, Madame Dorfman. <laughs> she got off. Anyway. Um, 
So uh, that's also good good piece. So the front, the, for me, the the um, Prelude Choral and Fugue. I actually learned it for the first time this past March. Um, started playing it this, this, a few, just a few months ago. But it was always sort of a special piece to me. I don't know why I didn't play it. You know, during this pandemic, a lot of people um, felt a sort of a call to play Bach, you know. Um, I did too. I sort of learned the Goldberg Variations. And so many pianists learned big Bach works. Um, you know, just somehow it seemed right during this time to, you know, spiritual time to find find some spiritual solace during this time we couldn't play and all of this. And um, but then somehow towards the end of it, I decided, I don't know, I still wanted to play something sort of that felt religious, but I just didn't really quite want to play the Goldberg Variations, even though I learned them. So I learned the Franck. And um, when I left New York and I went to study in, in Paris for a few years with uh, Yvonne Lefebvre, who was a famous French pianist and teacher and sort of the assistant to Courteau, Alfred Courteau, I know who we mentioned um, in this faculty forum yesterday. Courteau, does everybody know who Courteau was, Alfred Courteau? C-O-R-T-O-T. Who was maybe the greatest pianist for Franck of all time, I think. Um, all three of these pieces. The violin sonata was written as a wedding present for Isai, the famous French Belgian violinist. And I think it was premiered by Courtauld, I'm not sure. But there's a famous recording of Thibaut Day and, and Courtauld playing it. And he certainly played the Plan played Fugue and the Severation Symphonique, etc. etc. Um, in fact, um, Mr. Lowenthal, I know who was here a week or two ago, um, a few years ago played an arrangement by Courteau of the Va Franck Violin Sonata on piano. It sounds horrible. But he loved doing it. He just thought, oh, it's so great. Oh, it's Jerry. No. Goes, oh, yes, it's just, but whatever. I mean, it's just, it's just a piece. Just, we, people can't keep their hands off of that piece. You know? um, anyway, uh, so what am I talking about? Oh yeah, Madame Lefebvre, you know, th that time seemed sort of very distant to me now, but um, she had wanted me to play the Prévé Corral and Fugue, um, and there was a whole sort of interchange with certain people with her and that piece, but, um, you know, I mentioned to somebody that they should read Murakami. Um, some of the person here? Ask about that. This is a great Japanese writer, and he he writes a lot about memories and how memories sort of come up unexpectedly and transform. They come up sometimes as transformed memories or just a part of it, and um, sort of the cycle of life, you know, vis-a-vis -vis memories and relationships and things. Um, I often remember the first time I heard a piece that I love. I don't know, do, do you all feel that? Like, does, does anybody happen to remember the first time they heard the Prelude for All of You? Sometimes these memories become actually not true. There was, I remember when I was in fourth grade, I, was, I lived in, uh, in New York and we were moving our house and it was December, it was sort of snowing. And there was a girl across the street who played the piano, and the window was open, and she was playing the G minor ballad. And it was the first time I heard the G minor ballad. And I sort of always had a crush on her. She was much older than I was. And then she had leukemia, and she died. The whole thing became very sort of romanticized in my mind. But f I remember that as the first time I heard the G minor ballad. I remember the first time I heard the from. It was in Paris. Madame Lefebvre took us to, she had something called Jouet Musical. It was at the conservatory where Debussy studied in saint germain en laye And um, it was very inspiring summer because, you know, you were at this conservatory where Debussy was studying and learning and playing in the same rooms that he played. And I learned a lot of Debussy that summer with her. And just, I remember I saw fireworks and I was thinking, you know, Debussy wrote fireworks and 
he probably laid on the same lawn and saw the same fireworks. And, I mean, just, you know, you become, have associated. And I associated a certain girl who played the frunk that summer. Anyway, I digress. Um, so anyway, so Frank, in his works, um, tended to employ a cyclical form. So he would have a theme and would come back later. Sometimes multiple themes would come back. And that's very important in this piece. It achieves a certain unity. Um, he wasn't the one who invented this. Um, certainly Liszt used it. Um, Schumann, Schubert used it. I mean, all sorts of composers used it, but he made it his, very much his own. So his music is very contrapuntal, many like fugal elements, very chromatic, a lot of modulation. He was very influenced by classical forms and wrote in classical forms. Originally, this was meant to be a prelude and fugue, sort of an homage to Bach, and then he added the middle movement. And it's still sort of like a Bach, almost now it's like a Bach toccata, where you have a sort of a slow improvisatory first movement and um, a slow movement and then a fugue at the end, you know, show me a fugue. There's a huge religious influence on his music. I mean, uh, um, but all in all, I think the music reflects who he was as a person. He was very humble, he was very simple, he was very religious, he was very serious. Um, he did not seek fame or glory. You know, so he was in that way very different from uh, many musicians. Um, okay, so what else should I say? I have very disorganized notes. Yeah. The Frank was written in 1884, so I think it was six years before he died. So it was in that period where he wrote almost all of his. Um, this piece. So I thought maybe I would start, sort of show you some things um, first. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And you have to remember that he was an organist. So for example, if you hear places like Like here, for example. Um Thank you. 
petal and colors. So the form in the prelude, it starts with this offbeat rhythm. He could have started like this. for a while, then he has the second, the second theme that I mentioned, and then he has this theme that he develops first. Then he does the whole, that whole section again, but this time much more expanded. So... Example of that. 
so here. Some idea about the piece, right? Did we learn something? Yeah.